Hi everyone, this is Kim Aliyah, and welcome to a very special session with uh, my good friend Gabriel Traub, who will be conducting a six-week class starting May 18th, uh, running through June 29th. That'll be six consecutive Mondays, and that'll be running from 5 to 7 p.m. Pacific time. Let me uh, give Gabrielle a quick introduction, and then I'm going to pass it over to her, where she's going to do a presentation for about 60 minutes. And then we're going to leave about 15 minutes at the end of tonight's sessions for questions and answers. You can go ahead and type in your questions in the control panel on the GoToWebinar uh, session. And uh, you can type those in whenever you want, and I'll field those questions. And time permitting, I'll ask as many of those questions as is possible. So let me give my friend Gabrielle a, a quick introduction. Uh, Gabrielle has been involved in homeopathy for over 20 years. Uh, she practiced in a traditional medical OBGYN clinic for over 10 years alongside an OBGYN and fertility endocrinologist, where she specialized in women's health. She's also assisted natural births, including natural delivery of twins, and has a 20-month-old baby who was raised purely on homeopathy. Uh, she was recently invited by a world-renowned immunologist to join, her, to join his clinic, where she currently practices. Uh, she was also part of a core team of clinicians at an inpatient treatment center that specializes in eating disorders, addictions, post-traumatic stress disorder, and chronic pain, where she treats all the patients with homeopathy. Gabrielle has taught homeopathy in England, South Africa, Pakistan, Dubai, Australia, and throughout the United States. She's also taught childbirth classes for expecting parents, midwives, and doulas. She's also taught homeopathy to pharmacy students at the University of California. Uh, Gabrielle completed a six-year homeopathy medical degree program in South Africa, where she trained in hospitals and also rural clinics. And she dedicated a year to research conducting double-blind clinical trials on anxiety and difficulty in concentrating, including ADD and ADHD. Uh, Gabrielle produces and hosts the popular alternative medicine radio show called Vital Force. And she's also the founder of World Homeopathy Awareness Week and a former chair of the World Homeopathy Awareness Organization. Uh, she received an honorary doctorate for her contribution towards homeopathic research. And Gabrielle is currently on the faculty of the Homeopathic Academy of Southern California, the Los Angeles School of Homeopathy, and also the American Medical College of Homeopathy. And she's also involved with the Pacific College of Oriental Medicine, where she teaches Materia Medica, Anatomy, and Pathology. And currently, uh, Gabrielle practices in San Diego, California. So just let me reiterate again, Gabrielle is going to be offering a six-week class. It's going to be six Mondays running May 18th through June 29th. That'll be from 5 to 7 p.m. Pacific. All of the sessions, of course, will be recorded. And at the end of the course, you will receive a DVD. And uh, the early bird special for this particular course does expire tomorrow. So if you want to take advantage from learning from Gabrielle, this would be the time to do it. Uh, as the price will go up after tomorrow. And I just want to mention a couple of other things. Gabrielle has some of the most extensive clinical training of any of the homeopaths in our community today. She's just treated thousands and thousands of patients around the world. And uh, when she did a free session a number of, uh, about, about a year ago, uh, she received the highest praise of any of the free offerings that were given at that time. So it's with my great pleasure to uh, introduce Gabrielle Traub. Gabrielle, thank you for joining us. Hi, Kim. Hello, everybody. It's so wonderful to be on this webinar. You know, it's not very often that I get to talk about homeopathy and sex on one webinar, so this is really, really interesting and fun for me. Um, and today we're going to be talking about a really important subject, which is homeopathy for dyspareunia, which is painful sex in women. Um, a study was conducted a few years ago on 313 women, and 33.5% had dyspareunia at the time of the survey. 27% 0.5% had dyspareunia at some point in their lives. That's 61% of women have had dyspareunia at some point of their lives. 16% um, actually had it for their entire sexual lives. And in 33.7%, it had an adverse effect on their relationships. And most of the women had not discussed this issue with their primary health doctors. So this is very, very important from a homeopathic perspective. I really believe that sexual health has a big part to do with our vitality, our vibrance, and our overall well-being. And so it's very important to talk to our patients about this issue. 
there are two main types of dyspareunia. The first type is superficial, and that's the pain that women experience at the time of penetration. Deep dyspareunia is pain that women experience once penetration has occurred, and there are many different factors and reasons for that. Very common is hormonal, um, during menopause or perimenopause, um, breastfeeding. All this has to do with low estrogen levels. That actually affects those delicate tissues in the vaginal area. Um, it could be from systemic causes like diabetes, Sjogren's syndrome. Sjogren's is actually, I see more and more often in my practice, it's not an uncommon disorder and essentially causes a drying out of all of the tissues. There's actually a brand new test for Sjogren's that um, just became FDA approved, although it's not available in California where I'm from, but there are other tests that you can test for ANA levels um, and other autoimmune disease markers that we can test for Sjogren's. Trauma to the tissues. Um, Childbirth can be incredibly traumatic to those areas after episiotomy, sexual trauma, genital mutilation. I've had a number of patients who've um, had um, genital mutilation occur, and it's very violent. And violent intercourse, all of these things can cause trauma to those tissues and result in pain. Infections like urinary tract infections, yeast infections, genital herpes, HPV, all the types of STDs and pelvic in, um, inflammatory diseases and can cause pain on sex. There could be structural issues like fibroids or tumors. Um, the uterus could be prolapsed or retroverted. Um, there could be endometriosis or even adhesions after abdominal surgeries. There can be um, congenital abnormalities and vaginismus. Very common is psychogenic causes after any type of sexual, emotional violence or abuse. And vaginismus can also be psychogenic. Now, for those of you who have patients with psychogenic vaginismus, and vaginismus essentially, um, the vagina clamps down, so it contracts. So when um, there's penetration, nothing can get in. And if something gets in, it's very, very painful. And uh, uh, this may sound a little bit out there, but this is something I've tried with a number of my patients. With, where there's no structural issues, is to ask them, to ask their partners, to ask them for permission when they're penetrating or just before penetrating, and then for them to actually connect with their vaginas and ask their vaginas for permission. And I know that sounds strange, but there's often a disconnect between our minds and our bodies, and there's so much emotions trapped inside women's genital areas. It's they're incredibly um, emotional organs. They're areas where we, we trap pain and anger and resentment and fear. And whenever there's a discord between what's going on in the vagina area and what's going on in our mind, that can cause pathology. Um, so have their partner ask them for permission. They themselves ask their vagina for permission for their partner to enter. And if their vagina said yes, go ahead. And if the vagina says no, then stop and wait for another day. And when they're going ahead with a penetration, at that point, for the woman to say to herself internally, it can be an internal thought process that goes on, I give permission for this person to enter me. I open up my vagina, I open up my heart, I open up my whole being, and I fill the entire universe with my love. And that little affirmation, together with the right remedy, and sometimes magnesium is needed because a lot of women are magnesium deficient and that can cause the spasming, um, can make a profound effect on their whole sexual experience. Other factors are medications, IBS, bowel or bladder disease, um, skin disease like lichus planus and um, even psoriasis can cause dyspareunia. So when we look at the rubrics, I got this from Complete Repertory, there's only 35 remedies for dyspareunia. But when we go back to the statistics, they list 61% of women as experiencing dyspareunia at some point in their lives. So we know that this rubric is incomplete. What I've done for you is I've gone into other areas to look at similar rubrics to try to clarify and define dyspareunia in different ways. So pain preventing sex, we have um, rubrics for that. Dryness, we have rubrics for that. Pain on entrance to the vagina. Um, pain during sex. And this um, webinar will be recorded so you can actually slow down and go back to all these rubrics so that you can find them for yourself. Um, 
pain after sex, um, vaginismus, we have remedies for that, aversion to sex, prolapse and retroverted uterus, we have rubrics for that, fibroids and polyps. I'm going to go over a case with you today um, of a case of dyspareunia with fibroids. It's a beautiful case, and let's um, bring this up here. Okay. So this was um, a patient that I saw in August 2007, a 29-year-old female, and this was her experience. When I try to have sex or use tampons, it feels like knives. After sex, it feels like my insides are falling out. There's a lot of pressure. Even though it hurts, I'm promiscuous. I'll sleep with anyone who wants to sleep with me, male or female. I have a hard time saying no. I have recurrent, recurrent infections ever since a baby. I tried all sorts of medicines, but they didn't respond to treatment. Her menses are too early. Every 15 to 18 days, they dark, heavy, red, painful cramps. She bleeds for 10 days, breaks for 5 days, and then she bleeds again. It's endless. I have yeast infections before every period. Before my period, I'm anxious, emotional, irritable, sleepless, suicidal, tearful. I hate my periods. It makes me insane. I'm either always on my period, having PMS, or recovering from my period. It makes me absolutely rageful. I have a strong fear of becoming pregnant. I have constant vaginal discharges. They thick, white, heavy, constant. I hate it. I feel gross and disgusting. Her history of STDs. She had chlamydia at five years old, so we know she was sexually abused. One abortion. She has recurrent ear infections and lots of antibiotics before between the ages of two to ten. Scabies at 25 years old, for which she took antibiotics. People don't think of this, but scabies can also be a sexually transmitted disease. History of cystic acne and impetigo. Psychologically, she's bulimic and abuses laxatives, orally once a day and rectally four to six times a day. She was diagnosed with bipolar, lots of trauma and abuse, multiple date rapes, verbal abuse. She witnessed a lot of violence growing up. She would frequently witness her mother's boyfriend holding a gun to her head, threatening to kill her. Her mother has severe depression, is an alcoholic, psychotic, anorexic, food addiction, homicide, suicide attempts. Her sister is a crystal meth addict. Her grandmother is depressed, psychotic. Three siblings committed suicide. Her grandfather is alcoholic, mental illness, and multiple suicidal attempts, so there's lots of psychiatric illness in the family. In the generalities, I am bone cold. I love hot, dry heat. I love to bake in the sun, to dry out and get a sunburn, my absolute favorite feeling. I love to be like a lizard in the hot sun. Food aversion, seafood, extremely sensitive to odors. Sleep is poor since infancy, waking, sleep talks, grinds teeth, horrendous nightmares. Her digestion is she has IBS and chronic constipation. Drug use history, cocaine, crack, benzoid, whippets. She can, currently uses benzos and whippets weekly. Why, what I observed as a patient is her eyes flooded on speaking, especially with emotions. She is intense, and she was missing the lateral third of her eyebrows. That actually is an indicator of hypothyroidism. Tell me about your mood, I asked. I'm in a very dark period. I feel vulnerable, scared, anxious. I obsess with everything. I spend 25 minutes deciding whether or not to take a shower. I'm indecisive. When I'm anxious, I binge or pick at myself. Everything feels so intense. This is the first time I've been in love, first time I've ever been in an intimate relationship. I have low self-esteem. I cannot conceive why he loves me. I haven't slept in nine days. And that's a problem because we know that for bipolar patients, mania can be induced by insomnia. I've been binge eating, taking lots of t tons of laxatives, sometimes a whole bottle, two to seven glycerin suppositories in the morning. I don't feel rooted anywhere. My mom is an alcoholic. She was super abusive. And the patient cries. She used to get mad at me all the time for no reason. She told me I was a bitch because I thought my shit didn't stink. I have a fear of going to the bathroom. In my teens, I had to go for enemas because I couldn't have a bowel movement. I obsess. I spend more time thinking about shitting than anything else. Then I worry about my weight. I obsess about my vagina. My vagina is so painful. It's a stabbing pain and bleeds during sex. I have so much fear around sex. I did it because they wanted. 
violent sexual actions. I used to fantasize about murder. It's hard for me to feel sexy. I wanted to gouge their eyes off and tear their skin off. I feel as if I had to get out of my skin and attack them. Unlimited rage just attacking. I asked her to draw an analogy to an animal, like a pissed off cat. I want to make them bleed, cut them out, make sure they know how angry I am about what they've done. I feel unhinged, hot, almost burning anger. I throw things, I get so mad. I get mad at the computer, throw my computer across the floor. I bash my head on the dryer wall. I'm so pissed I cannot control it. It comes out in my tongue. I say the meanest, coldest, bitchiest things. I check out and somebody else completely different checks in. I can't control it. The person who takes over is just like my mother. My biggest fear is to become like my mother. I can't stand her. I'm still angry with her. I want to push her down the stairs. It feels so dark as if I'll never come out of it. I don't know how to feel attractive. I'm so scared of losing my boyfriend. I used to think that people who fell in love were lesser beings, just dumb. I don't enjoy, I don't deserve to enjoy sex. I asked her to tell me about her nightmares. I dream about very big, bearded men with big weapons running after me. They're crazy. Their faces are deadpan, psycho, running after me. There's always blood in the dreams, gruesome dreams, people falling off buildings with their legs or heads ripped off, vomiting blood. I was doing or just watching pouring blood, dissections, but not clean dissections, they are jagged dissections, cutting people's out, eyes out, big splutters of blood. At 23, I recovered from alcoholism. I was convinced I had bad blood and wanted my blood to pour out. I got pregnant and had an abortion. I'm drawn to catfish. It represents what others see as dark and gross. I see the beauty and lovingness in them. The pond was my sanctuary. I loved the water, my world. I used to imagine that they were the only things in my world. I feel like the catfish, those who I am. Catfish are mud dwellers, muskiness, live off the bottom of the pond where it's dark and murky. I'm dark. I love getting dirty. I work with homeless people. When I'm around people who are the most crazy, the most mucky, I think they are so wonderful. When in that dark, yucky, hard-to-find place, I find the light. I don't do very well if everything's okay. Catfish are very graceful, but they will bite or sting you. They are very dark, but not in a bad way. They live in dark water, only where you can't see them. They're easy to catch, but hide well. The male are the life-givers, the nurturers. They watch the eggs 24 hours a day. They fight when they're angry. They're very territorial and protective of the crew. Their whiskers are beautiful. Tell me about your bulimia. I restrict, binge, use laxatives. I can't pass a bowel movement if my roommate is home. I obsess about bowel movements. I'm very much into blood, gore, violence. I love watching gory horror movies. I love watching CSI, that they cut things up, that very gross stuff. I love it. I should have gone into forensic. I w watch mixed martial arts. If they draw blood, I love it. If a fight gets broken up, I get disappointed. I love gross, gory movies, hacking, cutting, gross. Okay, so that's our case. Any remedy suggestions, anyone? So uh, feel free to type in uh, question, uh, suggestions on remedies or any other thoughts about the case. And I'll, I'll relay those to uh, Gabrielle, and then she can respond. So, okay, we've got a few uh, suggestions already. Uh, one suggestion that um, one of the participants makes here is Veratrum Album. That's a beautiful choice. I love Veratrum Album because it has the violence. It has the bone coldness. Um, you know, it has that kind of disconnect with other people. That's a really good choice. It's not the remedy that chose, but a very good choice nevertheless. Anything else? Yes, somebody else here, uh, Gabrielle, suggests the remedy Lachesis. Lachesis, very interesting. She actually made a lot of references to reptilia and reptiles. Um, Lachesis is generally, um, can be very jealous, and she is. She's very jealous and suspicious. We see that actually in the follow-up, um, and very intense. She has all the intensity and the loquacity of Lachesis. I love that suggestion. It's a very good choice. Um, 
The problem with Lachesis is she's actually bone cold and Lachesis is generally more warm. Lachesis is also much better as soon as the flow comes and she is worse throughout her period. She never gets a break from it. The, the, the good suggestions. I love those two. Anything else? Yeah, here's another one, Gabrielle. Somebody suggests the remedy uh, Lysin Hydrophobinum. Beautiful remedy. Lysinum is actually the remedy made from the saliva of a rabid dog. And um, this is actually a very, very important remedy for dyspareunia. It's one of our main. If we look at the rubric, it's a it's a type 3. It's one of the main remedies. Um, and they uh, have a lot of history of abuse, of being beaten down, downtrodden, sexually abused, and they lash out. They feel anger, a lot of anger and rage and violence. Um, it, it is a beautiful remedy. Now, <clears throat> it is somewhat associated to the remedy that I gave her. Very interesting choice. Uh, so here, uh, we've got a trifecta here. Somebody's suggesting three different remedies. They, they are suggesting Thuya, uh, Staphysagria, and Carcinosin. Mm, beautiful choices. Well, Staphysagra, this patient actually saw a number of homeopaths before she came to see me. And Staphysagra was the obvious choice, but she was given that remedy by a previous homeopath and no effect. Um, but Staphysagra is a good choice because it covers the anger, the wanting to do violence in response to the anger, the ailments from abuse, from sexual abuse. Um, so, so it was a good choice. Carcinosum is also a very important remedy for dyspareunia. And um, whenever there's a history of um, abuse or torment, um, and she has something that is carcinosum like, it's not a symptom that's indicated in carcinosum. But later on, I kind of viewed her fluttering of the eyes when she spoke with emotions as trying to control it, trying to keep it inside. And we know that carcinosum and staphysagria both like to control those emotions. So that, that's good that you brought up that remedy. Um, good choices. Okay, we have another suggestion of Thuya. Thuya. Thuya is a beautiful remedy, especially when patients feel so terrible about themselves, badly about themselves. That, that sentence she says that I feel like I have bad blood and wanted the blood all to go out of me, that's a very Thuya-like symptom. Um, and Thuya can be very cold as well. Thuya can be a very important remedy when there's um, any type of sexual abuse. None of these remedies, however, really encapsulated the essence of this patient. And we'll go over step by step um, what that looks like. Any other suggestions before we move on? Uh, well, one person, there's a suggestion of anacardium here. And then there's also somebody uh, suggests that it's maybe an animal remedy. There's actually a few people who suggested that it potentially could be an animal remedy. Well, let's talk about anacardium first. And anacardium, um, also another chili remedy, another remedy that's great for any type of split, like uh, her bipolar disorder and wanting to do violence. She says she wants to hurt them, wants them to feel the pain. That's very, very anacardium-like. But when we get to know this patient on a deeper level, we'll see a level of sensitivity that the anacardium doesn't have. What animal remedies were suggested? I'm um, interesting to, to hear. Uh, well, there's a suggestion here for lactfolinum. That also is a very good remedy. Lactfolinum has a lot of the thwarted sexuality and twisted sexuality. It was actually, in fact, a remedy that she had already been given without response, but they have that anger. And she also describes herself as a cat. I don't really practice like that um, too much, but it, but it was given, so it's a good choice and a good remedy to think of. And there's also a suggestion of... Uh... Ambergrisia and lactcaninum, those two other animal remedies that are suggested. Lactcaninum and ambergrisia, um, those are also good choices. I'm surprised that nobody actually mentioned the catfish. We actually do have a homeopathic remedy made from a catfish. It's called Fractocellus hemolepterus, and this was actually a remedy that's available from Europe. There was no proving done on this remedy, and I'm not that comfortable giving a remedy when we know nothing about it and there's been no proving done. Um, so I did look at what are some of the, some of the symptomatology of catfish um, injuries. Now, catfish don't actually sting, but if the spines pierce your body, it, can, it, it contains a toxin, can produce a really painful reaction with a lot of throbbing pains and swelling and inflammation. Um, however, the symptomatology of catfish poisoning did not resemble any of the symptoms of this patient. She had, didn't have any of those throbbing pains with the swelling. Her pains were more stabbing, so I didn't unfortunately see any similarity there. 
Um, so you want a lot, there's, there's, there's quite a number of people on the call and there's a lot of suggestions. You want me to keep giving you suggestions? Or? Well, uh, anything that stands out, Kim. Well, I, I think else? it's interesting that there's a, a couple suggestions for the remedy Stramonium and then there's one individual who just wrote Solanacea. Interesting, very interesting. I like those both. Let's move on and, and see how I got to the remedy. Okay. Okay, so let's look at the case analysis. Um, what was important for me was the intensity of her symptoms, her personality, her history, all of her symptoms, her eyes fluttering on speaking, especially with the emotions, um, the eyebrows listen, uh, missing the lateral third. This is the things that I observed, and also that she was very destructive, self-destructive in her eating disorder, in her drug use, and so forth. Key words that she mentioned were knives, pain on having sex feels like knives, stabbing pain, violence. Her menses made her violent, the fact that her mom's boyfriend held a gun to her head, that there were three siblings suicide, that her mom is suicidal and homicidal, that she fantasized about murder, wanting to gouge their eyes off and tear their skin off, violent sexual actions, her nightmares were violent. Um, so there's a lot of that violence, um, wanting to push her mother down the stairs. There was a lot of reference to insane. Her periods make her insane. There was a lot of insanity in the family. A lot of blood and gore and gruesome. She said that she's had bad blood and she wanted her blood to pour out. Lots of jagged dissections. A lot of rage, how she gets during her periods. Her discharges of leucorrhea, menses and emotions, and the trauma and abuse. Um, words that she mentioned in this case are lizards, catfish, don't feel rooted, obsessed. I don't deserve to enjoy sex, to fall in love. I'll sleep with anybody who wants me. Let's look at what her main complaint is because whenever we're treating a patient, we want to address the main complaint. Well, the dyspareunia with the vaginal bleeding is very important and that's probably caused by her fibroids. Her eating disorder is an issue because if she's not getting the nutrition she needs, if she's abusing laxatives, she's not going to heal. Her bipolar and her addictions and then less so is the nightmares, the insomnia, the irritable bowel syndrome and the constipation. So let's look at that in a hierarchy of symptoms. Well, the rage and violence is the strongest feature, and then the bipolar, and the drugs and laxatives, because if she continues to use those, she cannot heal. The bleeding on coition. You know, some women have dyspareunia, but when they have bleeding on sex, that usually indicates that there's more pathology there, insomnia and so forth. It affects her mind, her uterus, her vagina, and her bowels. What's the etiology in this case? Well, there's definitely a history of abuse, emotional, physical, and sexual, her eating disorder, and possibly the abortion. We don't know that for sure. What were strange, rare, and peculiar symptoms? Well, she had many, actually, um, but what I observed was the fluttering of her eyes. What does she feel? What are her sensations? Well, her dyspareunia feels like knives. There's a stabbing pain, and she feels bone cold. So the themes in this case are blood, gore, violence, rage, and definitely intensity. Which myism does this remedy fit into? Well, she's had a history of scabies, uh, which was suppressed with medication, so sorrow's there. Um, now, I'm looking at Hahnemann's five main myisms. Just to avoid confusion, we're going to just stick with these five myisms for now. One thing that I'd like to try and create a movement for is in homeopathy, we loosely use the words like syphilis and psychosis. And I don't think we realize what weight or emotional attachment that has for patients when we mention that symptoms just psychotic. And we do have alternative names. We have an alternative name for psychosis, which is the figwort myism. And we have an alternative name for syphilis, which is the loetic myism. Now, even though patients are necessarily going to be thrilled at the idea of being told they have the figwort disease, it's still a lot better than being told they have psychosis. Um, unfortunately, we don't have an alternative name for cancer yet, but I would love for us to move away from these terms because they just don't represent what they mean to the you know, general society. 
So with the fig wort or psychotic myosome, there's lots of discharges, her leucorrhea, her menses, which is nonstop. There's overgrowth, production in the fibroids and the bipolar. There's lots of destruction that we see in the luetic myosome, the self-destruction, the alcoholism, the abortion, the violence. There's some tubercular issues, the bruxism, the grinding of the teeth, and there's definitely something from the cancer myosin and the history of abuse. However, I would perceive that the, the myosin that's causing most damage in her right now is the luetic or the syphilitic myosin because that self-destructive is, is really what's causing most um, imbalance in her system. So when we did a repertorization, I, I, I I put in the general rubrics, and how I like to do it is I take the rubrics and then I, um, you know, kick some out to try and um, the ones that are more general. And I actually looked at the top 20 remedies that came out, and out of the 20 remedies that came up, I, I honestly gave each of them good thought, but none of them really represented what she was experiencing. Um, so I looked at, and this is a shortened list of what she was given. Um, she was given actually many, many more remedies. She was given lachesis with no reaction, staphysagria with no reactions, lacphaline with no reaction. To back them, she had some reaction to it actually helped some of the help her issues. Really, she was still having pain and bleeding during sex. She was still using lactose, so it didn't have that strong effect, but it had a little effect. Um, Daphne had no reaction. Rad Brahm had no reaction. So lanum uh, tuberculosum had um, a tuberosum helped a little. Um, and in fact, both tobacum and solanum are both in the Solanacea family. A couple of you brought that up. Um, so the two remedies that she had some reaction to at all were two remedies from the Solanacea. So I remembered a case that I had read that was published um, in 2001. Um, and this is a case, LSB. And the case goes as follows. The girls she's very, very, very cold. Her, she has destructive behavior, hatred, inner violence, desire to break things, moody. Whatever she feels, she fitted on the Red Bull, an evil character in the last unicorn video. She likes to watch the bull catching the unicorn. She loves reading horror stories, fantasies, and magic. She has difficulty going to sleep, nightmares about skeletons and wild animals. She doesn't do anything halfway. It's one extreme or the other. Her mom has a hard time setting limits. She pushes against them all the time. She has a remarkable connection to animals, fascinated with them. She likes to draw pictures of them and tell long stories. She wants to save uh, elephants. On Halloween, she dressed up as a killer cheerleader, and the year before it was dots stuck all over her face, and she loves Halloween. She described her costume as a cheerleader uniform with a knife stuck through her chest, blood splattered across the front of her sweater, dripping down her face. One arm was mangled and dangled as if it had been nearly ripped off. She has masturbated since she was one and a half years old. Now, this case had none of the pathology that my patient had. But there is a lot of similarities. Remember, this is only a child. So what I did is I went to the proving of this remedy because the best way to learn anything about the remedy is always to go back to the original proving. That's how you're going to get the most important symptomatology. Now, this remedy has actually been proved by five different homeopaths in 10 separate trials. It was actually proved first in 1834 by Defresne, by Richardson in 1874, by Mesger in 1951, by Rayside. He did three provings between 1963 and 1964, and the last proving was done by Schmelmach in 1995. So there's a lot of information that we can find on this remedy. And what did I find in the proving? They have disturbed dreams with horrible nightmares, sexual dreams, 
Uh, it helps with fertility. There's a lot of coldness, stabbing pains, depression alternating with happiness, just like bipolar, difficulty concentrating, lots of gastrointestinal symptoms, bowels inactive, constipation, coldness, darkening of the vision. Okay, so there's a lot here that refers to our patients. What do other authors describe it as? A chilly belladonna, insane root by Clark, restless, excitable, hysterical, euphoria alternating with depression, hypersensitivity, emotional frustration and instinct suppressed, ins insecurity, crying alternating with euphoria, changeable, oversensitive, nervy, irritability before periods, fear of losing control, nightmares about blood, accidents, murder, tragedies, eating disorder with binging, irresolution. She had so much irresolution, she couldn't decide whether she wanted to take a bath and that would take her hours and hours every day. Abandoned, rage was spitting by Marilli. So the remedy I gave her is a very interesting plant which is Mandragora officinarum, the mandrake. Now Mandragora has actually been used in herbal medicine and in magic and in movies, it was in Harry Potter. I'm going to play you a clip from Pan's Labyrinth and this is a director's edition so you're going to see Look at the little brute of the mandrake. So she takes blood to feed the, the mandrake root. This is a beautiful movie for all of you to watch. Okay, so um, that's a little bit about mandrake. Let's look what Mar Morrison has to say about mandragora. Mandragora's world is dark and evil, where apart from being devoured by animals, he has to cope with the dark world of the evil sorceress, black magician, the world of bloody and gory violence. Let's compare Mandragora and Belladonna. So it's a chilly, attenuated form of Belladonna. It's intense but less acute. Both have congestive, throbbing frontal headaches, dilated pupils, right-sided laterality, nightmares, but Mandragora also has kleptomania, controlled expression of emotions, and remember how she blinked her eyelids spasmodically, sensitivity to tobacco smoke, and desire for cheese and fish. Now, some of you actually mentioned the Solanaceae, and I'm so pleased that you were astute enough to realize that. That's beautiful that you did. Some of you mentioned Stramonium, which is um, very, very close to Mandragora as well. So what potency did I decide for this patient? And at the time I felt I wanted to match the intensity of the potency with the intensity of her state. And she had actually previously done well on high potency. So I ended up giving her a 1M as needed. I trusted she was familiar enough with homeopathy to use it very sparingly. What happened? How did this patient react? So she actually called me two weeks later Almost instantly after taking the remedy, I developed a fever. It felt like I was on fire. I was flushed and burning. Interesting. It's similar to Belladonna. It lasted a few minutes and then it went away. A few minutes later, I fell asleep and I had a dream that I was in the desert chasing a giant snake. I wasn't scared of it. The remedy is certainly working. I'm sleeping a lot. I could sleep all day if life would let me. I found myself saying no. I would never have been able to do that before. Confusion around my boyfriend is completely gone. I don't feel overconfident or bold. I don't feel anything except not bad. It's hard to explain, but really wonderful. There is still some pain during sex, but it's so weird. It's like I don't care that it hurts, and it's better in spurts. I'm not worried about what it is or why I have it, and I definitely don't have the feeling of being disgusting or toxic anymore, which is really changing the sex experience. I'm so much more relaxed. 
the funniest thing is my eyebrows are growing back. It's been like that since you saw it for as long as I can remember, and now it's growing back. It's so weird. 22 days later, I'm doing so well. It's amazing. I'm sleeping well for the first time in my life. I've been exercising. Running is easier because my breasts aren't hurting anymore. I dreamt I was watching horrible accidents on the highway, and I thought it doesn't have to happen. That's really profound. The last two weeks, sex has hardly hurt at all. My sexuality has changed. I'm more emotionally present. I used to have major paranoia with jealousy, thinking about him about sleeping with his ex. Now I don't even think about it anymore. I'm open with him about my feelings and my fears. I have more insights. I've cheated in every relationship I've ever been with. My fear of cheating on him is gone. My cystic acne has cleared up. My boyfriend commented on how good I look, less reactive, more open and communicative. I'm not late as often. I feel as if I'm stoned. I'm so carefree and relaxed. I feel exciting to be starting the semester. I'm saying no to the things I don't want, establishing boundaries. Remember before she hadn't, didn't have any boundaries. She would sleep with anybody who wanted to. Energy is great. I'm not as anal about things anymore. I'm relaxed. I'm not judging myself. More self-accepting. The feeling of why my boyfriend doesn't love me is not there anymore. I don't feel extra special or superior. I just feel good. <clears throat> I had a lot of anger, but it's expressed now. I don't keep it inside. I used to feel like my boyfriend was lying to me, manipulating me. I don't feel like that anymore. I've been exercising regularly. I've lost weight. I've had the desire to keep moving, stretching. The eating disorder is gone. I'm not worried about my weight. I'm not binging. I'm not using laxatives. I'm constipated and have developed hemorrhoids. Now, it's understandable that she's constipated because she was using laxatives for so many years, but that's also a returnable symptom. Follow-up one month later, after the first follow-up. Sleep is fabulous. Energy is good. I've had a desire to stay active and stretch, desire to eat healthy, not binging. My friend commented that she had never seen me climb like I did last week. She was rock climbing. I was climbing like I've never done before. It never occurred to me to hesitate. One month later, her boyfriend broke up with her. As she had become healthier, they had drifted apart. He wanted to continue being unhealthy, eat unhealthy, do drugs, being unreliable, and she was starting to stand up for herself. She experienced a brief period of sadness, but quickly realized that he wasn't the one and was able to move on. Every time I see this patient for a follow-up, I am amazed. She honestly gets better and better and better and better. Physically, the dyspareunia, the bleeding on cohesion, the fibroids are gone. Eating disorder is gone. Laxative abuse is gone. Drug addiction and alcoholism is gone, although she, was, uh, she had recovered from alcoholism before. Bipolar disorder is gone. Fears of intimacy are gone. Fear of being happy are gone. Insomnia is gone. The nightmares are gone. Today, she is a completely different person. She is extremely healthy and balanced physically, mentally, emotionally, and sexually. Today, she is married with two gorgeous children brought up in homeopathy with no reoccurrence of fibroids during the pregnancy. Remember, that, that was something I was concerned about, is when a patient has fibroids, the hormones during the pregnancy actually cause the fibroids to grow. In fact, when a woman goes into menopause, that's often the time when fibroids shrink. She is an unbelievable mom. Just uh, last month, I saw a follow-up, eight and a half years later from the time I gave her the remedy, and she continues to do very well. In fact, she's transformed into one of the most incredible human beings I'm honored to know it's honestly a life-changing um, remedy. This remedy was for her. Any questions or comments? Let me uh, see if there's any questions. Um, there's a comment here, has overcome terrible history. Uh, oh, yes, somebody asks here, could you comment on your posology? Uh, how often did you repeat the remedy? Yes, so I chose a 1M potency. I wanted to match the intensity of her state with the intensity of the potency. And she had also been given high potencies in the past and had tolerated them. She didn't have any negative reactions to them. In fact, she was mostly unreactive to most of the remedies she was given. Um, I, I really um, don't like to 
be too structured in how I have patients repeat the remedy. I really like, as their homeopath, I really like them to teach them to become aware of their bodies and to learn to see when they need to use the remedy. In fact, I really enjoy doing this for children, and I have five-year-olds go and tell their mommy when they need to redose the remedy. It's really a good idea to teach them from a young age and to educate your patients. Um, I didn't want to say to her, take the remedy once a week, once a month. I wanted to tell her that when things are moving, the, this is how I describe it to patients. I say, when you take a remedy, it's like learning to ride a bike. You just need that first push to move, to get moving. When you're teaching a child to ride a bike, you give them that first little nudge, that first little push. And the moment they're moving, you want to stand back and back off and leave that patient alone. Because if you keep dosing when things are moving, you're either going to slow things down or get an aggravation. And then when they fall down, sometimes they'll get back and ride on their own. So we need to give a little bit of time there too. But if they moving backwards or they feel stagnant or things aren't moving along, it's okay to repeat the remedy. Now, I assess this. I assess whether a patient's going to be capable of this. Some patients need more structure, but if I am able to give them loose structure, I find it much more beneficial in the long term and is much more educational and helping them to take charge of their own health. So I tell her, I, I, I describe it just like I'm describing to you, that we never give a remedy when things are moving. When anything's in motion, we don't give a remedy. When there's aggravation or amelioration, even if it's the smallest amount of improvement, if there's any continued change, we never repeat the dose. And you know, I get a lot of calls of patients. I have a lot of patients aggravate, and, and luckily I have a staff of wonderful people who manage that and help me with that. But I'm very much determined to stick to putting that power in the patient unless I feel that they're not capable of doing that. Um, I often give a remedy in water. For this situation, I actually just gave it to her dry because I felt that that was, you know, it was simplest for her to, to be able to do. Good question. Is that clear? Yeah, very good. Uh, so, but there's a lot of questions here. I don't know. How, do you have a lot more to present, Gabrielle? I can ask a couple more, maybe. Um, let's take a look. I have, why don't we finish? Um, this is going to be very short just to finish. I want to give you a few okay. other and, and, then, and then I'll ask, and then I'll ask questions yeah. after. Okay, sounds good. Yeah. Mandragora is not a very common remedy. So I want to give you a few more remedies for Dyspareunia. So at least you have something to go home with. So, what I actually did in, in this case is, as I mentioned before, 61% of women have dyspareunia at some point in their lives. And there's only 35 rubrics, uh, 35 remedies in this rubric. So, and mandragora is not even in this rubric, so we know that it's not a complete rubric. Um, however, <clears throat> whenever I'm looking at a rubric, I always ask myself the question, well, why is that specific remedy in this rubric? Because different remedies are in a rubric for different reasons. So what I did for simplicity, and because we don't have a lot of time, is I took the five bolded remedies and I broke down in modern day language and terminology and diagnoses why each of those remedies are in this rubric. So let's look at argentum nitricum or silver nitrate. And we know that um, Argentum nitricum is actually a very important remedy for a lot of the STDs, especially gonorrhea, genital warts, inflammation of the cervix, even syphilis. And it's actually a very important remedy for HPV or cervical inflammation or even erosion. It's also an important remedy for diabetes and vaginismus. They may have painful sex followed by bleeding, especially if we have some of the structural pathologies. It's a very important remedy for stricture of the urethra. And and when a patient has urethral stricture, that sets them up for a lot more urinary, type, um, urinary tract infections. And so they're going to get repeated urinary tract infections. Um, they have yeast infections. Um, structurally, this remedy is a very important remedy for prolapse uterus, for fibroids. The ovaries are inflamed and hard, and even cancer of the cervix, of the uterus, sorry. Hormonally, it's a very important remedy for menorrhagia, menopause, and emotionally, these patients often have anticipatory anxiety before sex. We see this a lot in um, men, sexual disorders in men, um, erectile dysfunction in men. Um, whenever they in the situation where they're ready to have sex, they get stage fright, um, and they f worry about their performance. But women can have this too. They also have a fear of losing control. They may have claustrophobia or fear of being trapped. 
um, pinned down, and so this can also affect um, their their bodies and make them tense up, so that they have vaginismus or other types of pain uh, in dyspareunia. Lysinum. Somebody brought up this remedy, and it's actually a very important remedy for dyspareunia. Lysinum is a, a remedy made from the saliva of a rabbit dog. Wonderful thing to tell your patients. That's what you're giving them. Yeah. This um, lysinum has actually cured many cases of a prolapse uterus and is very important for urinary tract infections. We know that lysinum has this desire to urinate whenever they see running water or hear running water. <clears throat> there have been cases of people washing dishes and that sound, they need to go and urinate constantly. It's a very important remedy for leucorrhea, yeast infections, herpes. <clears throat> It's a remedy for vaginismus, for pain since childbirth. You know, childbirth can be very, very traumatic, but childbirth in some women who have a history of sexual abuse or rape can bring up a lot of those traumas again. It's a remedy for diabetes. <clears throat> in lysinum, they have hypersensitivity of the genitalia. Even the slightest touch or draft of air can cause pain. Um, and there's often a history of physical or sexual abuse, fear of suffocating, choking, claustrophobia. Any touch really aggravates them. And they have this dichotomy of excessive sexual desire and ailments from suppression of their sexual desires. But the moment they touch, it causes intense pain. They also have a fear of being ridiculed and violent rage followed by remorse. <clears throat> Natrium muriatium, which is made from sea salt, is a very important remedy for herpes, for vaginal dryness caused by menopause or Sjogren's. Um, there's a lot of um, structural issues such as vaginismus, prolapse, uterus, diabetes. Um, they, in infections, they can have a thick, white, transparent, acrid leucorrhea. Emotionally, they may fear intimacy, fear opening up sexually, and fear of getting hurt or being rejected. They often have the desire to use dirty words during sex. They may have poor body image and a history of abuse, either physically, emotionally, or sexually. And then we can't have this lecture without mentioning sepia. Sepia is a beautiful remedy made from the ink of the cuttlefish. And as we know, this is very well known for its hormonal effects in the system. It's a very important remedy during pregnancy, postpartum, um, menopause. It's also a very important remedy for gonorrhea, genital warts, AP, HPV with erosion of the cervix, for lots of yeast infections, urinary tract infections. Um, structurally, they susceptible to vaginismus, endometriosis. We know this is an important remedy that has cured many cases of prolapsed or, or retroverted uterus. Um, for vaginal dryness is a remedy for Sjogren's, menopause, after menses, lichen planus. They often have a low libido, and this is very much hormonally connected, but they can have an aversion to sex or even to being touched sexually, aversion to their partner. Um, big reason for this is they feel so drained, worn out, and depleted that they have absolutely no interest in sex. It just feels like another burden, another chore. I mean, emotionally, they can have a poor body image, and the pain may be so severe that it actually prevents sex. And lastly, we're going to talk about platina or platinum metallicum. Um, and this is a very important remedy for STDs like gonorrhea and herpes. They may be promiscuous, which makes them more susceptible to these diseases. You know, sex is a very interesting thing. Um, it, it's something that causes so much pleasure and so much pain and so much guilt and shame and freedom and being trapped. And, you know, it has the ability to create new life. But it also is the one activity that makes you more susceptible to many, many infections, um, especially if there's promiscuity. So there's so much around sex. Um, they suffer from vaginitis and yeast infections and urinary tract infections, fibroids. They, again, can have prolapsed or retroverted uterus. Just like in lysinum, there's a hypersensitivity of the labia and the vagina, which can actually make the vagina impenetrable. And they may have involuntary orgasms, just like a lysinum, they have a very high sex drive. But with platina, they have difficulty attaining true intimacy or being vulnerable. 
um, there's a sense of narcissism, narcissistic, they haughty or seductive. There's often a history of sexual abuse or molest. There may be sadomachism or dominatrix. Um, this is, I just treated a patient the other day with restless genital syndrome with this remedy. And the pain may be so severe that it may prevent sex. So let's um, open up the floor to questions. Great. Uh, should we put on the, let me just quickly mention about the class again. Would you mind? Um, mm, absolutely. Great, thanks. So first of all, fantastic presentation. I know, it was a lot, I know it was a lot of information to give in a short period of time. Yeah. Yeah. I just, before we get to the questions, let me just mention again that uh, Gabrielle is going to be offering a six week class on um, obstetrics and gynecology with with homeopathy, women's health conditions. And that's gonna be starting May 18th and running through June 29th. That'll be six Mondays. I think there's one break in there uh, for some holiday or something or other. But anyway, it'll be almost six consecutive weeks. And the, uh, the early bird does expire tomorrow. So uh, this is an opportunity to study with somebody who has a tremendous amount of clinical experience and obviously is very capable of uh, pre preventing, presenting the information in a very clear and cogent manner and uh, offers lots and lots of useful clinical tips. So I, I highly recommend this class. I think it's it's uh, something that really anybody can benefit from, and I'm looking forward to it myself. So thank you very much. Okay, let me get to the... Kevin, I wanted to mention that uh, there's a lot of causes of dyspareunia that we'll actually be covering in subsequent lectures, oh. like some of the hormonal issues and some of the structural pathologies. So um, this, this issue will be expanded into you know all of our lectures great fantastic okay so our uh, first question here is uh, you know obviously this is a very dramatic result in this particular case and so one of the yeah. participants asks how often do you expect such a profound response with patients mm -hmm. That's a really good question. You know, as a, as a teacher, I'm always going to present my most dramatic, wonderful cases and, you know, uh, just because they're exciting. The other reason why I present so many dramatic cases is that's what students remember. I feel that if you read a case like this, you will never, ever forget Mandragora. You will always remember this remedy. So that's the power of being dramatic. Um, but is this a normal? Absolutely not. <laughs> you know, my, my bread and butter of my practice is sulfurs and pulsatillas and lycopodiums and you know it's not every day that a mandragora steps into my office um, and you know often the more intense the pathology the more dramatic the reaction there, there's more of a difference to what's normal and healthy um, I have had the experience working in inpatient treatment facilities where the patients are actually supervised 24-7 and have treated very, very severe pathologies in that very controlled environment. So uh, I had the wonderful experience to treat you know, many of these dramatic cases in a controlled environment, but it certainly isn't everyday practice. And you know, when you, when, when we're teaching, you're always going to see the most dramatic responses. I'm not going to share a case with you that was 10% better. You know, I want a, a life-transforming experience. Great. Okay, here's another question, Gabrielle. Uh, um, the participant asks: As her symptom picture changed, did another remedy? become evident or did you only treat this patient with mandragora? That's a, such a good question. I'm so glad you asked that. You know, it's interesting because in many of these severe pathologies, the patient will need one remedy for a very, very long time. And as soon as she was out of the mandragora state, she has no longer needed this remedy. I've been, the last time I treated her was just a few weeks ago, I gave her phosphorus. Um, she's needed remedies like phosphorus and pulsatilla and sulfur and, and really benign remedies. Um, interestingly, uh, one of her children needed belladonna at one point, but really benign remedies. She completely moved away from the state. And the state of Mandragora, her, her symptom picture now does in no way resemble the state that she was in previously. So there's no point in repeating that remedy. Great. Okay, here's another uh, one of our participants, actually somebody from Japan. And she asks, um, she'd like to know how you organize such a complex set of rubrics is what I would like to learn in your course. She's taken the course. What, would you, what, were, your, what were you thinking when you eliminated some of your rubrics will interest me? 
Okay, very good. What I like to do is, first of all, I never completely eliminate rubrics. I actually organize them on different clipboards, and I keep them so I can always go back. What I like to do is first throw in everything, like the whole bucket list of rubrics, and then I either group remedies together or use elimination features, or I decide, well, which rubrics? What I wanted to see is we have so many patients with leucorrhea. We have so many patients with profuse menstruation, but how many patients do we have that want to gorge people's eyes out or push people down the stairs or have bleeding on sex? So many women may have pain on sex, but when there's bleeding involved, it actually introduces a whole new level of pathology. So when I was trying to narrow it down, I tried to eliminate well, what was common rubrics that a lot of people could have to be able to discern which is the most unique remedy for this patient? Um, and when we go, when we have more time on the course, um, you know, we'll spend much more time on repertorization and choosing rubrics and, and, and things like that because I think it's very, very important. I want to stress that even though my repertorization didn't help me in this particular case, I still repertorize every single case. It's just something that I do with every single case. I will never prescribe a remedy without repertorizing. I think it's very, very important. The worst scenario is if the patient needs a very simple, easy to find remedy and you miss it because you're looking in the wrong place and you're digging too deep. So um, yeah, I still repertorize every case. I, I, I really appreciate you saying that because it reminds me of that quote of George Rotokos when he said something like, you know, a, a lack of books on uh, somebody's uh, table or, or desk in another field may show, may be a sign of intelligence, but in homeopathy it just demonstrates ignorance. And, yeah. you know, it's so true. So um, here's another question from one of the participants. They ask, uh, will we receive PDF notes or MP3 recordings of this webinar? I'm going to go ahead and answer that one. So the answer is yes. Um, uh, Gabrielle will be producing PDF slides uh, that will be posted. Uh, she'll actually probably post the cases before so people can look at them. And then she'll be posting the slides so people have a written record of everything that she's presented and also all of the sessions are recorded so if you can't participate in any of the live sessions you can watch them after the fact and then also at the very end of the course we take all of the PDF files all of the cases all of the repertorizations all of the uh, mp3 and mp4 files and we produce a professionally produced package it comes with two discs uh, one is just mp3 files so if you want to listen to it in your car if you have an mp3 player and then also uh, another disc with mp4 files so you can actually see the whole thing and uh, as you can see uh, Gabrielle presents a lot of information and she's kind of like me she does it fairly quickly so you'll have an opportunity to, to listen to these over and over again and, and really uh, really gain a lot of, of knowledge and wisdom and intelligence about how to use this information to the best benefit in your own practice. Did you want to add anything else to that? No, I just wanted to say I've enjoyed being with you all so very much. Thank you for your interest and for the opportunity to present. Um, as you can tell, I love homeopathy and I love teaching it and it's just a real honor to be here. So thank you. Do you want to finish or do you want to ask a few more questions? Um, do we have more questions? Well, yeah, we have a lot of questions. Okay. <laughs> let's, uh, let's, let's choose do, your let's top do, let's five. Do five. Let's do five more minutes, okay? okay? okay. All right. Okay. Good. <laughs> um, okay, so uh, what is uh, restless genital syndrome? Okay, restless genital syndrome is when women have um, uncontrolled orgasms and it can happen in very um, embarrassing situations. They could be in the bank, they could be at work, and they um, it's actually just been defined recently, um, but it's, it's, um, you know, it's something where they can't control their orgasms. Okay, I'll make this last question, Gabrielle. Uh, somebody asked, can you give a syllabus of the course or at least what topics will you cover during the six-week course. Okay, there actually is that on the slide. Let me just scroll down a little bit. So here we go. You can read with me. Oh, we're going to be talking about hormonal imbalances, menopause, perimenopause, PMS, delayed menarche, uh, infertility, pregnancy, childbirth and postpartum, postpartum depression and breastfeeding issues, structural issues. We already covered some fibroids, um, but I do have a few more slides on that. PCOS, endometriosis, um, menstrual problems, irregular menses, painful 
multiple menses, heavy menses, sexual issues, again, low libido, high libido, uh, infections like urinary tract infections, interstitial cystitis, yeast infections, um, BV, and HPV. And we'll, we'll cover most of it. There may be some areas that we won't have time for, um, but I'm going to try and cover as much of that as possible. Great. Well, it's going to be a great course, obviously. And there's a lot of thank yous here. Uh, thank you, thank you, thank you. Great presentation, excellent information. I'm really excited about the course. I'm really excited about the course too. So I can't, I can't <laughs> wait to take it myself. And again, uh, the early bird special is ending uh, tomorrow. So if you aren't just yet, please go ahead and sign up. And I think uh, that would be great if you want to. If you want to have the, I'm sorry I didn't get to all the questions, but if you have more questions, you know, you'll have an opportunity to ask them during the, the six week course. And Gabrielle, I want to thank you again. If you want to say anything else before we, we end the call, that'd be great. Just thank you, Kim. Um, I'm so excited to be on this webinar and to be involved with Whole Health Now. So thank you. Yeah, my pleasure. Okay. Good night, everybody. Thank you, Gabrielle. And uh, look forward to uh, doing another free cast very soon. Take care, everyone. Bye bye. Good night, everyone.